Hi, welcome everybody to uh, this uh, SIG webinar. Uh, my name is Sayuri Sharper and I am the president of the MIT Social Entrepreneurship Alumni Group. Uh, today, we have uh, what I think is gonna be a really interesting and exciting webinar that will be led by Professor Sean Cole. Uh, Professor Cole is uh, uh, teaches at Harvard Business School, um, has also founded a social enterprise called Precision Development uh, that uses technology to reach uh, a lot of uh, people um, who are in need of more information for better lives. And he is also uh, on the board of MIT j -Pal. So he brings uh, to us um, if, uh, perspectives from both teaching and research, as well as his experience on the ground. To make the conversation even more interesting, we have with us uh, four social entrepreneurs who are running companies. Um, that are using technology, again, to reach uh, as many people as um, uh, they, they can, can reach. And those panelists uh, will uh, have a conversation together with Professor Cole as we go forward. And the panelists are uh, Sonali Meta Rail from Awazda, Christopher Sheehan from World Cover, Sebastian Zapata from Alpha and Aloysius Ada from Farmerland. So you will not only hear about kind of from an academic perspective, how we reach as many people as we can in the developing countries, but also how is practice uh, on the ground. So um, I am gonna be the moderator for this session and uh, we will start uh, with uh, Professor Cole providing us with some background and then we'll uh, move forward to the conversation. So uh, before we get started, I just wanted to uh, introduce who MIT SIGIS. Uh, we are organized under MIT Alumni Association, and our mission is to bring together MIT alum and like minded people to co create a better world through social entrepreneurship and impact investing. By social entrepreneurship, we mean organizations that address a basic unmet need or solve a social or environmental problem through a market-driven approach. For, uh, in terms of impact investing, uh, we mean investments made in companies or organizations with the intent to contribute measurable social and env environmental impact al alongside uh, financial return. So uh, we need both of these groups of people to push us forward um, in our agenda uh, to make a better world and everybody um, are encouraged to be part of our community and to join uh, just go to mit-c.mn.co with that uh, let me uh, welcome professor sean cole and uh We'll hear from him. Great, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, and uh, greetings to MIT alums and whoops, uh, uh, other interested people. So uh, as mentioned, I'm on the faculty at Harvard Business School uh, where I teach a class on impact investing. Uh, and I'm also the co-founder of this nonprofit that I'll talk about. Uh, but very briefly, my background, I was at MIT from 2000 to 2005 where I did a course 14 uh, PhD with my advisors, Abhiji uh, and Esther and Sendel, uh, two of whom went on to win the Nobel Prize. And this is my wife and myself in Stockholm a couple of years ago uh, at the party. Uh, this nonprofit that I'm talking about today was actually co-founded with the third winner of the Nobel Prize, Michael uh, Kramer, who was a professor at Harvard uh, at the time. 
Uh, I've been at Harvard since 2005. I do a lot of research on financial services for the poor and impact investing. I teach in the MBA level, basic, you know, FIN 1, FIN 2, uh, as well as a, an impact investing class. I have a role at the Poverty Action Lab where I'm co-chair for research, education, and training. Uh, and I also do some advisory work for BlackRock and PPG Rise and, and, and Meridium, which uh, are financial services companies. I just wanted to step back briefly and talk about the PAD origin story uh, because Sonali is on the line. Uh, and uh, also because it's, uh, you know, it's important to know. Basically, Nilesh Fernando is a PhD student at Harvard, and he and I worked with Avaz Day, which was a social enterprise in Gujarat, uh, to evaluate a mobile phone advisory service that, that provide farmers uh, agricultural advice. Simultaneously, Michael Kramer, who is another Harvard professor, uh, and Sendhil Mulanathan and Rais Fabregas were working in Kenya to evaluate an SMS-based service. And we both found very positive, encouraging results and together with two other people decided to create an organization that was uh, uh, would, would go on to design, deliver, and evaluate uh, services. And I say, you know, if, if you're an MIT alum and you're watching this, maybe you have some interest in tech uh, and development. You know, we're always looking for uh, uh, support and help uh, on product design, uh, tech management, et cetera. So if you're interested, uh, just, just drop us a line. Uh, but let me step back. I'm just going to take about uh, 10 or 12 minutes to talk about precision development and our approach. Uh, and then I think we're going to just open it up to a much broader conversation. We've got a lot of really interesting people uh, on the line here who are going to tell you about uh, uh, fascinating things that they're doing uh, in other countries and contexts. And you know, it's not impossible to, imag to me uh, to imagine that this conversation could spark a future uh, collaboration. So PXD uh, was it was founded as Precision Agriculture Deferred Development, but uh, about three months ago we made a decision to explore. It uh, interventions uh, outside of agriculture. So the X now stands for, uh, you know, the unknown variable, or you, you can sub in for, for whatever you want. Uh, but I'll talk primarily about agriculture because that's where we work. It's a global nonprofit organization operating in 10 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. It was co-founded in 2016 by uh, three professors and an MBA alum from Harvard Business School. Uh, right now we have about 200 employees with a mix of technology, data science, agronomy, uh, researchers, and program managers. <clears throat> The mission is to provide actionable information and other scalable services to people in poverty to empower them to sustainably improve their well-being. One of our founders was sort of saying he was previously in a philanthropy role and he was scouring the world for compelling uh, philanthropies. And he was sort of frustrated that even the best philanthropies uh, were growing at a rate slower than the population of smallholder farmers was growing. So as many checks as he wrote, he felt that, that they could never actually cover the entire base of smallholder farmers. So uh, he was excited to join us because our goal is really to, to develop interventions that can scale to reach uh, you know, 100 million uh, smallholder uh, farmers. Most of you are probably familiar with uh, smallholder farmers. They're 70% of the world's poor. Uh, global food demand continues to grow. We've got important concerns about climate change, soil and water uh, constraints. We've got yield gaps uh, around the world between what, what we could be getting, uh, say in corn, rice, and wheat, and what we're actually getting. And especially in Africa, you've seen uh, yields not grow nearly uh, as much as you might've expected based on uh, growth in other countries and sort of a lot of questions about, uh, you know, how long it will take for the green revolution to, to truly transform African uh, agriculture. You know, there's also a view that, that we hold deeply that there's a tremendous opportunity uh, there's information uh, that exists, but farmers may not have access to it, or they may not trust it. It may be out there, but they may not know whether to believe it or not. And you know, the arrival of mobile phones in uh, rural developing settings has enabled uh, both uh, access to information from the farmer side, but also individual level customization in terms of content that we push uh, to the farmers. Uh, we build farmer profiles, and then we can tailor the information uh, to them based on their seed variety, their planting date, uh, their soil type. And so we've seen dramatic growth in access to ownership. And you know, now we're seeing certainly in India and less, less quickly, but also present in Africa, uh, the, the arrival of access to data services uh, as well, which opens up an entirely a new set of tools that you can uh, offer to farmers. So what we do is provide quality agricultural advice. We collect information from the farmers on their location, their agroecological zone, sociodemographics, crop variety, water management systems. We also we combine that with agricultural data, whether that's uh, soil type or, or soil tests, if the government's providing those, rainfall, market prices, pest disease uh, outbreaks, and then provide customized recommendations uh, to the farmer with regards to input recommendations, management advice, uh, whether uh, market information, uh, weather-related content, 
uh, and others. I think, <clears throat> you know, we're, 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 you, we work in a, a variety of modalities. So in Africa, we tend to focus on uh, SMS because the cost of voice is uh, substantially higher. In South Asia, we use a lot of voice communication, which helps bridge literacy gaps. We do regular push calls uh, timed around the crop calendar to farmers. Uh, there's an IVR as well as a Q&A hotline. So basically farmers can call in, record a question, and they get a customized answer pushed back to them uh, within uh, four hours. So it is a two-way uh, delivery service uh, uh, or communication service where we uh, sort of crowdsource the problems by relying on a, a constant flow of inbound questions uh, as well as uh, outbound surveys to make sure that the information is timely, relevant, uh, and actionable. Uh, we're making uh, some progress on launching uh, mobile apps uh, as well. I guess we have a slightly animated version of an SMS service that we have in Kenya that Safaricom sent out to the entire nation where you, you, you text farm to a short code and then you give them your name and then you can answer some uh, sort of A-B questions, uh, give your location and it will sort of, the, the chat bot will figure out where you are, what type of crops you're growing and then start deliver, uh, delivering uh, customized uh, advice at, you know, I should say, we're a slightly poor fit for this setting in the sense that uh, ev everything we're doing is free to the farmer so far. And it's not that we are opposed to the idea of collecting uh, revenue from farmers, but <clears throat> in our experience, it's very expensive to collect revenue from farmers. And we're also very committed to reaching the very poor farmers. And so as soon as you start charging for services, we've seen in many other settings, use of those services uh, drops a lot. So right now, our primary buyers of our service are governments or uh, bilateral, multilateral uh, aid agencies, although we've done pilots with uh, input dealers uh, and other entities uh, as well. And I'm happy to talk uh, more about that uh, if we get time. So our theory of change is uh, uh, outlined right here. We, you know, we wanna acquire uh, customers and focus a lot on user engagement, which is something that's very easy to measure as an out outcome. So are they listening to the messages? Do they pick up the call? Do they call in and ask questions? And you know, every, every message we send out, we ask them to rate the message at the end of the message. So what kind of feedback do we get uh, from them? We're focused a lot on reducing frictions and barriers, making sure that the content that we deliver is uh, easily comprehensible. There are often challenges between what, let's say technically trained agronomists think they would like farmers to be doing and what farmers sort of on the ground uh, have as their opportunity set. And so we work a lot to, to try to translate uh, more complicated practices and easier uh, actionable uh, messages. We measure, we constantly measure uh, aspirations, motivations, uh, and, and capacities of our farmers. We're focused a lot on uh, behavior change. Are they adapting the recommended inputs or, or the recommended farming practices? And we've gotten lots of uh, evidence. I'll talk, I think, a little bit more about how, how we evaluate uh, our services later on, uh, that, that we are successful in changing farmer behavior. And with the ultimate goal of improving uh, farmer and household welfare, whether that's crop yield, livestock production, avoiding crop losses, we focus a lot on benefit cost ratios and, and on, on what things will, will benefit uh, farmers. So what is different from uh, other attempts? And, you know, you know, at, at one level, you know, it's interesting to hear the stories uh, after I'm done, because when, when we first surveyed the space, we felt like there were a lot of entities out there that were trying to develop revenue models for smallholder farmers. Uh, on a for-profit basis and not reaching very large scale. Like it was a difficult nut to crack. So we focused uh, on getting to scale uh, at, at a very low cost. So low cost communication is one thing. Uh, Human-centered design. So taking a very farmer-centric uh, approach to our service rather than sitting in, a, in an office as an agronomist and thinking what, 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 what do the farmers need to know? Thinking a lot about customization and targeting. Uh, we try to, you know, set up and run ourselves as like a tech firm with a lot of iteration and learning, uh, both A-B tests, uh, as well as randomized control trials to, to measure impact, you know, use data services and free to the user would be a, a, another key uh, differentiator, I think, from a lot of uh, other settings. How do we measure yields? Uh, so if you look at science, there's a, a, a publication that provides a meta-analysis of a bunch of the evidence that we and others have generated on the impact of agricultural advisory on outcomes. So we found a four percentage point average increase uh, in, in yields, uh, a 22% increase in recommended farming practices and a 10 to one benefit cost ratio uh, from the service. So for every $5 a government uh, spends on the service, farmer income goes up by uh, $50. Now we also found large variation in the impact estimates across studies. 
It turns out it's actually very hard to measure the impact of agricultural uh, interventions on farmer outcomes because uh, yields often measured pretty imprecisely. If you ask farmers what their yield is, you know, they might have a good sense. They actually often don't have a good sense of the area of their land. And so it's actually pretty noisy. We've been doing a lot of work with satellites to measure yield uh, via satellite uh, after we've walked their field. We have a, a, a much more precise uh, measure of, of how well we're doing. But there's, there's sort of a, 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 I would say, you know, the, another interesting thing is these are all on sort of version 1.0 interventions. I think the interventions are getting a lot better. So I expect uh, larger impacts uh, going forward. Uh, you know, we've been fortunate uh, with respect to COVID-19 to be able to continue to operate because uh, almost all of our uh, services are delivered uh, virtually. We've had to slow down our research and development portfolio a bit uh, when we haven't been able to do face-to-face uh, -face contact, say, with, with, with focus groups. But we've even managed to expand uh, into Nigeria uh, and Colombia with uh, remote programs. We switch, switch some of our research and data collection to remote surveys rather than uh, individual surveys. And in some areas, we've been collecting and distributing uh, uh, health information or information about market uh, disruptions. So to date, we've reached about 5 million farmers, uh, uh, 4.1 inactive programs in nine countries, and sort of South Asia is where our numbers uh, are largest. Uh, and we, we work uh, in a variety of models. I think we have a direct service model, which is actually the smallest uh, share of farmers, less than 5%. This is kind of our sandbox or the setting where we, we control everything and we can try whatever we want, uh, test new new ideas. We do this in Gujarat, uh, for example, with uh, the users, and we're still using Abbas Day's uh, technology uh, in, in Gujarat. Most of our work is through partnerships where we co-develop. We're doing a program, for example, the government of Odisha, where we build, operate, and then transfer a service over to the government, uh, where we're reaching, I think, around 1.1, 1.2 million uh, farmers there, but they will eventually take over uh, the service. And then in other settings, we provide a bit more of an advisory role uh, where the government, for example, in Ethiopia already had an established service with a million uh, farmers, but brought Pat in to help them uh, improve and, and develop the service. So uh, <clears throat> as mentioned earlier, we're expanding our mission to address uh, information uh, poverty uh, more broadly. Uh, our first forays have been in, in education and thinking about digital education tools, uh, especially, for example, in Kenya, when schools were shut down uh, because of the lockdown. Uh, so I, you know, I, I could go on forever. We've got uh, many, many slides. You know, our, our cost per farmer is, is declining a lot because we're really focused uh, on scale and developing uh, high quality digital uh, interventions. So we're down to $1.38 per farmer per year, uh, uh, which is, I think, remarkably uh, low. Uh, we're funded in a common, by a combination of governments uh, and, and donors. We're not yet on a... Uh, even a break-even model. So we have some unrestricted philanthropy that helps support our, our core services. But as we build and expand, we're making we're, we're costing everything at, at fully costed so that we cover administrative uh, and overhead. So I think you know our ambition theory is uh, in, in a few years, we will be a social enterprise uh, as, as you would classically uh, describe it, uh, although we are uh, to date a, a nonprofit uh, organization. So uh, you know, I'm I'm I, I I'm super excited about what we're doing. Uh, like I said, we're we're always looking for people who are uh, interested in, in in working with us. So if you think you have competence or expertise that you could bring uh, usefully uh, to Pad, don't hesitate to get in touch. But I think we have so many exciting people on the line that I want to make sure that we have uh, time for a conversation. So I will uh, end there. Thank you so much. Um... That was a great intro, but uh, we do have four panelists, great panelists that can also share their experience. And of course, one interesting thing is their business model as to how uh, they are also trying to make the business uh, sustainable, profitable, so it can grow. Um, can we uh, ask all the panelists to, uh, unmute uh, so we can switch to uh, uh, gallery mode where we can see everybody. All right. Um, let me start with uh, Sadali since uh, Awazda was mentioned and that was a technology that uh, Sean's uh, team started working with. Um, 
So what I'd like to do is going around and for everybody to do a quick intro of their, their company, but focus on how technology is, is part of how you deliver services. And since uh, Sean challenged us about cost to the, the farmers or folks that are receiving the services, I, I'd like to understand a little bit also about your business model. And I know we are, are tight on time, so I'm gonna ask each of you to try and do that in three minutes or less. <laughs> so Nali, you go. Thanks, Ari. I'm very happy to, to be here and looking forward to hearing from, from all of the other entrepreneurs. Um, I am the co-founder and chief growth officer at Awazde. Um, we are an India-based fintech uh, social enterprise uh, now, expanding access to finance for India's um, underbanked. Um, but for the last decade, actually, and this kind of goes back to you know the origin story that Sean shared a little bit about, which we share, um, we've been developing cost-effective mobile communication tools that cut across language and literacy barriers to make sure that information can reach um, everyone. Uh, and as Professor, Professor Cole mentioned, my, my co-founder, Dr. Neil Patel, actually collaborated in some of the early research work that became the foundation for our platform today, as well as precision development. Um, currently, we're, um, we are focused on financial inclusion. Um, we're partnered with some of the top financial institutions in India. So it's a B2B um, enterprise model. Um, some of our clients include Axis Bank, Ujivan, l and Financial Services, and a, num a number of others. Um, today, we are reaching between 8 and 10 million microfinance customers every month through our platform. And those are primarily low-income rural women. Uh, microfinance borrowers. Um, and the way it works is that we send um, personalized vernacular language, we're, we're live in about 11 different languages, um, interactive nudges and confirmations um, throughout the customer life cycle. Uh, so for the banks and the MFIs who are our partners, we drive market proven results um, on things like collections, upsell, um, and that incentivizes them to communicate directly to the borrower and our platform allows them to do that cost effectively. Um, that channel otherwise doesn't really exist in the microfinance uh, industry in India. Rural finance in India really relies very heavily on in-person um, field staff communications. And so this direct connect to the customer really empowers customers with the information that they need to make informed financial decisions, it brings a lot of transparency um, to the industry, improved customer protection, um, as well as eventually financial access as well. Um, and prior to prior to Awazde, I, uh, I co-founded another social enterprise called Mela Artisans. Um, that company works on providing a sustainable global market for Indian artisans. Um, and I'm currently on the board uh, still. And I also served as India director at Tala. Some of you may have heard of them. They're um, quite big now, a leading global FinTech company that works in alternative credit scoring and smartphone-based loans. Great, thank you, Sonali. And let's move to Sebastian, who is representing Latin America. Uh, in terms of our, our panelists. Uh, so quickly about uh, your company, your business model, and how you're, are you using technology to reach uh, all the people you serve? So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is, is Sebastian. I'm the CEO and founder of Elefa. We are a Colombian-based company, and we have a network of more than 12,000 women that live and interact in rural Colombia. Rural Colombia has about 13 million people. So what we are trying to do is to connect these people that live in rural Colombia uh, with products and services that we enjoy in our cities. And we do it uh, through technology. So we develop an app and this woman go and sell these products, uh, pre-sell the products and we deliver them uh, from the city uh, to, to the rural areas. We provide microcredit 
uh, of around between 100 US dollars and 500 dollars. So they can set up their business, sell the products, collect money, and repay us. Uh, so this way, we are helping and contributing uh, to stop the immigration from rural areas into the cities. Uh, that's how we do it. And we are recognized, or we were recognized by the UNDP uh, for our commitment with the Sustainable Development Goal. So we are BC2A, and also uh, we have funding from Jusnus Social Business. We are part of the portfolio of the Jusnus Social Business Network. Great. So now we're going to go to Africa, the continent of Africa. And uh, let's start with uh, Aloysius. Same Hi, question. <laughs> Hi, cool. Hi, everyone. My name is Aloysius from Ghana. I'm the co-founder and CEO of PharmaLine. Family has been around for close to nine years now, and our mission is very simple. Uh, we want to make, we want to, uh, you know, we want to build partnerships, technology, and finance farmers to make more money. Uh, we are focused exclusively on money because we don't want farmers to just survive. Um, you know, typical example is that farmers produce cocoa in Ghana, and cocoa, like you know, is a hundred billion uh, revenue a year sector, and farmers make less than two percent of that. They do all the, most of the hard work. But then they don't get a lot of the money. So we are singularly focused on giving them three things: uh, give them access to high quality fertilizer and seeds, um, uh, help them with information and best practices using technology, but then still old school, uh, you know, methods of training farmers in person. We still do that. And then finally, building partnerships around them to help them to make money from their produce. But we we realize from years of doing the work that when they get information, when they even get access to the services and the produce, and you don't help them to sell. They still don't make any difference, uh, you know, in terms of money in their pocket, which is what most farmers care about. Um, so that's what we focus on, and uh, we do this across 25 countries around the world. Our work in Ghana, we are heavily involved in giving farmers fertilizer and seeds. But across other countries across uh, uh, the world, uh, we basically license our technology as a service uh, to mainly the food sector, the, the you know the private food sector, like so you know the Hershey's of the world, the global commodity sectors. They are beginning to move away from. Uh, um, uh, to um, corporate social responsibility work, to sustainability work, um, which means that they want to uh, bring our work as part of their work ongoing. And we see that as a very plausible path towards sustainability. Uh, you know, so we use that approach to reach as many farmers as possible. Thanks. Great. Um, and our uh, last panelist, uh, but uh, also probably involved uh, and have lots of experience. Uh, and uh, maybe some of the aspect of the business that uh, perhaps was uh, too early um, is Christopher, uh, would you like to talk to us, us about uh, your company, how you ran it, and, and any issues that you ran into as you try to scale the company. Nice uh, way to forebode, uh, but that's exactly <laughs> right. So uh, I'm, I'm Chris uh, Sheehan, the uh, CEO and co-founder of a company called World Cover, uh, where for the last uh, six years or so, we brought weather insurance to smallholder farmers uh, starting in West Africa to East Africa and actually even to uh, Southeast Asia. Um, we essentially used a technology called index insurance or parametric insurance, which has been around for decades really, uh, where we would use satellite uh, imagery to measure rainfall in a certain area and pay farmers when it didn't rain enough for them to get a good yield. Um, we uh, went through the Y Combinator Accelerator 2016. We raised money from many venture capitalists, including Index Ventures, Greylock, um, Mitsui Sumitomo Insurance. Um, not so many impact investors, actually, but uh, I can speak to that uh, as well. Lots of experience pitching to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of investors over that time. Uh, many no's, some yeses. Um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, really in the last year, just uh, determined that product market fit was not in our future and wouldn't warrant another round of venture financing. So we took the decision to close the business down earlier this year. Um, 
And so I'm happy to talk about that experience to anyone. I'm spending a bit of time mentoring, if I can, uh, social entrepreneurs anywhere in the US, in Africa, wherever. So if any of you are attending and have some questions you want to talk through, reach me on LinkedIn. And I'm working on a new idea related to blockchain and foreign exchange in emerging markets too. So if that interests you, I'm happy to speak. Um, I studied CS at MIT and finance at MIT uh, way back in uh, 2006. Um, thanks a lot. Great. So now I, I'd like to ask each of you again, and then we can just go by the, the same order is, why for profit? And how do you think um, you are making a different uh, impact um, by going for profit rather than uh, being an NGO uh, supported by donor fund funding, uh, perhaps in addition to uh, getting some uh, payment uh, in other ways? So Sonali, you want to take that one and we'll go around? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I will say that I do think that um, in, in the social enterprise sector, often there's a mix. Um, so for example, with Alazde, you know, some of our early work was grant funded. I will say, you know, we have worked a lot in agriculture before in the early days and have kind of pivoted more toward financial inclusion. And a lot of the R&D behind that pivot actually came, you know, we were only able to do that because we got a Gates grant, you know, that allowed us to take big risks and try things out and do a lot of A-B testing um, and experiment. So, um, so I will say that, but I, I think in terms of why for profit, I, I think um, for me as an entrepreneur, um, you know, it was always... Uh, one thing is that, you know, your relationship with your investors, at least from my perspective, is one that's kind of, of more of, on equal footing or mutual respect as compared to um, kind of going out and seeking charity. That's just my personal opinion. I don't know if anyone, you know, others would agree with that, but I just feel like there's a different relationship with, you know, entrepreneur to investor. And that's, you know, to me, that is important and it's kind of empowering for the entrepreneur. Um, I also, um, you know, in terms of sustainability, being able to continue the work, you know, it's great to get that, you know, original grant funding and there are organizations that are able to continue. Um, but uh, in many cases, when I've spoken to other entrepreneurs who have gotten some grant funding or even nonprofits, you know, there'll be something that works. And then, you know, it's proven to work. And then the grant funding is, you know, the grant funder is no longer interested. They're on to the next new idea, which is what they should be doing, I, I believe. Um, but uh, then, it, you know, it's hard to, it's really hard to sustain a lot of times um, to scale it up and to continue to constantly get more and more grant funding. Um, I also think it's a, it's an interesting space to be in, right? You know, where was day, we have been trying to find the intersection of the interest between the financial institutions, in, the, in this case, uh, banks, and, the and their interests, as well as their customers' interests, um, who is, you know, as a social enterprise, that's who I want to work with, right? The rural women, that's who I want to empower. But one of the best ways, the reason we've been able to reach, you know, 10 million women isn't you know, because I, you know, got grant funding and, you know, tried to reach 10 million women on my own. It's because I plugged in to a massive industry and I found a way to find kind of the intersection of, of value um, for, for two distinct groups. And so I think that that's, um, that can also be really powerful when we look at kind of systemic change it's not always possible to start from scratch. You know, it's, it's really important to be able to work within um, existing systems and power structures to achieve the results. And sometimes that can really fast track your, your social impact and your scale. Okay, Sebastian, same question. Okay, well, for me, um, I think it's a little bit different. Uh, I come from the private uh, world. So I was an executive for Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson. And to be honest, I saw this as a business opportunity first uh, that was creating an impact. So I never even considered uh, to be an NGO. I didn't, I'm, just, I'm learning about the NGOs at this point, but uh, that was never an option. So. I saw this as a business opportunity that was very aligned with my purpose. 
And I think um, I'm still learning, but uh, I see and I run my business as a private enterprise and I have to make a profit and everything. And from my principle, I have to create win-win-win situations. Everyone in my supply chain has to win in order to be sustainable. And that's a principle that I have. So um, I'm still learning. I come from the private world and, and I never even considered this to be an NGO. I see this as a business and I think it's, it's, it's working well for us. So Sebastian, how many people are you reaching right now? Uh, so I have a, a community of 13,000 women and we impact around uh, 150,000 people in rural communities at this point. That's great. Um, Aloysius, are you still with us? Because uh, I don't see your uh, picture. Okay, there you yeah, are. Yeah. <laughs> same, same question. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think we actually debated if when we became Equine Green Fellows in 2014, we actually debated if should we be a for-profit or not-for-profit because we're trying to figure out how we could attract funding very quickly. Uh, but we realized that when we decided to go for-profit, um, the legal registration didn't actually matter. What mattered was the shift in mindset that the business of food can pay for itself and should pay for itself because a lot of people make money from it. So why is it that when it comes to farmers, like, you know, you know, we don't want to approach you with like, you know, very serious uh, uh, business principles. Um, like for instance, like, you know, and also another thing that we also realize is that like the true form of power is allowing nations and countries to run their food system by themselves. So like, so let's say if we, we have a program, let's say in Ghana, and that program is dependent on donations from around the world, like for forever, anytime that donation stops, then those farmers will be left hanging when there's an opportunity to actually make money from it and keep it sustainable. Don't get me wrong, we got grants, right? So in 2018, we got about almost a million dollars from MasterCard Foundation that helped us to actually prove our model, that helped us to actually like, you know, invest in infrastructure, get field officers, get them like motorbikes and all that. That like, you know, we, but we thought of that as an as investment and they pushed us really, really hard to think of sustainability. And for me, as someone who grew up in a farming community, um, we know for sure that farmers want to make money. Uh, farmers don't want to be indebted to anyone. They have dignity and they want sustainability and they want power. So we think that when it comes to, not all, not, not all interventions can be run as a business, I admit, but we think some food interventions can be run as a business. And if we develop the discipline to do that, we give true power to the people. Uh, and that's why we chose our approach. We, you know, just like how Sonali said, we didn't want to go forever. You know, we didn't want to be begging for money forever. We want to get money, prove the model, take some risks initially, and then become sustainable very quickly, um, you know, to keep it going. And, you know, that's why we chose our approach as Farmer Life. Great. And Christopher, uh, interesting comment that you made. Um, uh, is that it was harder to get impact investing funding uh, than from uh, just regular VCs. Uh, uh, but, uh, so in terms of your experience, again, uh, um, kind of quite for profit and, uh, and then what are the impediments for going that direction, I guess? It's a good question. Actually, something that uh, Sonali mentioned really jumped out and resonated with me. And it's, you know, there's a, there's a really a massive um, difference in culture, I would say, from NGOs to impact investors to venture capitalists, you know, in, in Menlo Park. And as you get toward the VC side, there's a consistency in motivation. You know the other person on the other side of the table what they want. They want a billion dollar outcome, right? They want to return their fund. They have a heart too. They care about mission and values. And actually they're, they're very excited when they meet, you know, someone like me working on this kind of mission, you know, in Africa or wherever. But it's, it's much easier as I have hundreds of conversations about how to create a story that resonates with them. Whereas with NGOs and impact investors, there's this, you know, and they themselves struggle with even internally, right? How do we trade off? And then even if they get that right, how do they communicate that to the entrepreneur? Here's how we trade off. 
uh, between impact and if you're a woman focused, uh, you know, and a company or focused on formerly incarcerated people or focused on Indonesia, you know, what's the universe of people you go to? Has their mission changed every five years? You know, Rockefeller, all these big organizations put out their five year plan or three year plan. Does it change? So it's really hard to navigate that. So I think if, if, if an entrepreneur is familiar and knows that environment very well, it could be a great option. But for at least for someone like me, who's just kind of knows profit and dollars and cents, much easier to go the VC way. And I'm not sure on the statistics. I'd love to hear maybe uh, Professor Cole knows, but the amount of money in VC just seems to be gargantuan and available and kind of begging for ideas. The amount of money, unfortunately, in kind of the NGO and impact world feels a lot more uh, capacity constrained. And that's another challenge for entrepreneurs. I mean, I'll just jump in here. I think what I we've taught often in our business at the base of the pyramid class at HBS, as well as my impact investing class is you know, the, the target customer sector has a big impact on the financial viability of the business model. So, you know, there, there are a few exceptions like microfinance, which have managed to, you know, have IPOs and, and sort of a successful business models at the very, very base of the pyramid. But even those models had a, you know, 10 to 15 year period where they were supported by a philanthropy, where they figured out the business model and were able to scale and grow. And I think you know things like transaction costs and customer education become very relevant when you're talking about the very base of the pyramid. Because you know to take a, I, I did some studies, uh, Christopher, on weather insurance, and so you might have to visit ten households and explain weather insurance, and two of them will decide to buy the product. But if you're trying to run a profitable business, those two who are actually giving you money have to cover the cost of educating the other eight people who decided not to buy the product. And so all, all of these costs, and, and so if, if you're doing customer education and selling a $5,000 life insurance policy to somebody in Nairobi, you know, where the premium is $5,000, then you can afford that, that overhead cost. But if you're selling a $10 uh, uh, weather insurance policy to a very poor farmer, then, then there's just no margin left once you take into account the transaction costs uh, and the overhead. So I think you know, I, I'm, I'm actually very optimistic about the value of private sector solutions in this space because I think digital is gonna dramatically reduce transaction costs. When we can deliver customer education through video, when we can collect insurance premiums uh, via M-Pesa and pay farmers back via M-Pesa, we can really drive down the transaction costs. And then there's the scope for value creation that the private sector uh, provides. And I think <clears throat> you know, there, there's some beautiful things about a private sector enterprise often that is extremely focused on the customer because you get daily feedback. If the customer is not buying your product, you have to figure out what's wrong and, and why aren't you develop, delivering something of value. Whereas it, let's say in the public education space, the customer doesn't have a choice. They're going to send their kid to your school and you know, they're not, you know, maybe you'll lose some people to private education, but there's a large segment that's just going to always consume the public school, no matter how good or bad the product is. And some of those feedback loops uh, aren't present. So I'm bullish and excited about the role of, of, of private sector, but I think it, it just turns out to be quite hard to make, make it work in the, the very poor segments. Yeah, it, it, just a quick note on that, thank you, is however, even with the, the very, um, I think, true unit economics challenges for some of these businesses, attract, you know, addressing these markets, at least I found it was the impact investors who were, for whatever reason, most uh, concerned about, you know, the financial model, is this sustainable? Is this finance, you know, what's the unit economics? How are you going to reach these people? It was the index ventures of the world, you know, sitting on a billion euros of funds saying, yeah, Chris, here's a million dollars to go try it out and let's learn, you know, as we go. And as an entrepreneur, that's what you want to hear so you can get into the field and start building, right? Versus building more models to, to kind of uh, su support that story. This is great, and I'm so sorry that we only have an hour for this discussion because I think we can go on for at least a couple of hours. But um, here's my last question, and then we'll open up for questions from the audience. Is so it's going to take a heck of a lot of effort, right? Because I mean, there are just so many smallholder farmers and people that need help, and all of you are actually doing amazing numbers in terms of the people you serve, but we've got to scale this. And how 
maybe starting from Professor Cole, do you think that we can do collaboration? And it certainly sounds like uh, Professor Cole, you are driving forward with uh, technology and you have the freedom with the funding sources you have. How do you bring that together into the ecosystem that the social enterprise lives and 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 then the other way um, in terms of making a, more of a systemic change rather than kind of a one here one there. Yeah, I mean I think collaboration is absolutely uh, essential here, uh, and you know in some sense we're selling to the government, so it's a collaboration between our nonprofit. Uh, and, and the government, if you take Chris's example, I think one reason the insurance company was invested, was interested in investing in him is they thought saw him as having a deep expertise in this segment of the world that had no access to insurance. And they're looking forward, where are we going to get growth in the next 10 or 20 years? And it's going to come from the base of the pyramid. So let's leverage, you know, a million dollars is a very cheap for them to get deep expertise in into this market uh, uh, segment. And so I think figuring and uh, Lucius mentioned, you know, interest in sustainability. And so I think, you know, the, the certainly my impact investing class, but I think in general, we're seeing capital markets and businesses getting a lot more interested, both in environment, as well as the well being of a smallholder farmer uh, communities. And I think, you know, while they are a lot of a lot of very poor families, they're also very poor. So a little bit of money can make a big uh, difference. And whether that, you know, we have a case study about a, a uh, farm roast, uh, coffee roasting company, where you can tip the farmer, you know, it, it does a very careful tracing of the, the beans to the, the cup. And so you can tip the farmer 50 cents if you liked your cup of coffee. And that, you know, you may, that's worth it to you because you feel good uh, uh, thanking the farmer for that great cup of coffee. But for them, if they're getting 50 cents a, cu a, a day from five different customers, that's like transformative uh, to their life. So I think uh, technology and collaboration are going to really help bring uh, people uh, closer together and unlock a lot of value creation, both for customers in the developed world who may care about climate change or, or other topics, uh, as well as smallholder farmers uh, and, and other people around the world. So um, trying to do this in just a couple of minutes, but how about uh, one of you uh, and what, what type of collaboration would you like to see either between social entrepreneurs or with academics and people that are more being funded for research of uh, this effort. Um, I'm gonna say Aloysius, you wanna take this? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, collaboration is key. Like from our work, we realize that, you know, we can't be everywhere, so we have to work with people. And I just like to like react quickly to some of the things that they said about sustainability and, and services. We found this out very quickly in our work to that. We are trying, when you're selling intangible services to people, Things that people cannot touch is really hard to sell and also it's very hard to put a premium on it especially to, to farmers right so when we try and sell information services to them it didn't make sense so so they were interested they would love the call but when they it's like it's like we are we are paying apple to us as their call center like it doesn't make any sense right but you are you pay for the iphone um and then you get a call center support services for free right um so those are some of the things that we are that that we that we are finding very exciting now for if you're providing a service that is intangible like maybe like things that people cannot touch like weather information uh it might be helpful to consider collaborating with um you know maybe fertilizer and seeds company or companies that buy commodities from farmers where they can offer your services for free uh, to them but they build it into the pricing model that may be uh, you know there's something there to explore uh, you know that's something that we are really really excited about and it could be a game changer where we can get uh, you know, a lot of insurance, like you get a lot of farmers insured and get a lot of farmers, uh, um, you know, access to information, but they get it when they get to, when they go and pay for the things that they normally pay for, which is seeds, fertilizer, and then when they sell their commodities as well. Okay, um, I have to give some time for the questions that's coming in, because I, I have a lot more questions for all of you, but I have to stop myself. So here is um, a, a question. So this is from Juan Roberto. Uh, could you please share your lessons about being effective in getting the initial clients for your business? Um, Sebastian, we'll go with you. 
Yeah, so first of all, like this is so, like I'm learning a lot. So thank you so much for each of the panelists because this is very interesting. I would say to building up the business is really expensive and really hard. And I think that's where you need to have more investment. Uh, I did a partnership with CPG companies and they co-invested in building the base of the customer, uh, the customer base. And that was very important for me. So for example, uh, I partnered with Unilever uh, to build the customer base and there was an investment there. Uh, once that you have that customer base, it becomes more efficient, especially for my type of business that implies a lot of logistics and it's very expensive to serve the initial customer. So basically transportation costs uh, was really high at the beginning because I was serving a very small base of customers. Once that you have the opportunity to fill the trucks and you have all your technology, so the fixed cost that I had at the beginning was high, but once you start building your base, costs go low. So I think when I'm linking back to part of the conversation that Professor Cole and Christopher were having about uh, collaboration, I think if you are able to demonstrate to private companies that there is a strong benefit at the beginning, and then they can benefit from it, they are willing to invest. So in my case, that I come from Procter & Gamble, CPG companies, I was able to demonstrate that there were millions of customers underserved, and these people consume their products, but if we were able to, pay, uh, to build a logistical and technological base, uh, they were going to profit from it. So. To answer your question, uh, the initial investment is high, but once that you build your customer base, it starts going slow. And that's where I believe you need to do a partnership with someone that's gonna benefit in the long-term or mid-term from that customer base. You're muted, uh, sir. Thank you, Christopher. Um, the next next question is from Rekha Pai. For the panelists who are bullish on the private sector, what do you think of the role of the impact funds in avoiding impact washing? And how can you differentiate yourselves in terms of the kind of impact you are creating and how they evaluate you versus your competition? Um, I'll give this one to Christopher. <laughs> As I Google the term impact washing, um, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know, I think may may maybe someone else is better here, but I think one thought on impact is, um, you know, you often do see, I think a lot more involvement in terms of um, the mission of your company by the impact investor, either directly or, or indirectly. I mean, even down to the term sheet, um, term sheets provided by some of the impact investors whose LPs themselves, investors themselves are, you know, Proparco, CDC, DFID, you know, some of these, um, you know, development financial institutions. So there is kind of a, a lot of pressure to, you know, do extra accounting and, and everything for the entrepreneur. So if maybe that's an aspect of impact washing, but um, yeah. I'll take this quickly. Okay. Okay, uh, go ahead. As we Sean. class on impact investing. I mean, I think, you know, one thing I certainly believe is that impact investing is a useful tool, but it's not the only tool. We still need government intervention. We still need charity. We need still need a, a lot of other tools in our toolbox to tackle uh, the, the problems uh, that the world's uh, facing. So I think some of the impact washing language comes from concern that people are overselling uh, impact. I think, you know, we are seeing an increasing uh, focus on credible standards uh, of impact. The, the IFC has developed operating principles of impact management, for example, and a bunch of uh, impact investors uh, have signed on. And I, th I think it's, it's useful to think of what the counterfactual is, right? If the counterfactual is business as usual with no attention to emissions, and we're seeing a firm at least reporting on its emissions and paying attention to its emissions, I see that as progress uh, in, in the right direction. But you know the beauty of impact investing is the investor who's allocating her own capital and can sort of decide what level of evidence or what standard of evidence they want 
uh, when, when they decided to make their investments. So I'm perhaps less concerned about impact invest, impact washing uh, uh, than some others. I can, I can maybe provide some of my experience that I come from the private world and I didn't have like a methodology or knowledge of how to do and how to sell it. Uh, when I got the um, contribution or help from United Nations with the uh, business call to action recognition, they helped me to develop those goals more clearly. And that, that really helped me a lot and gave me the structure. Like I knew how to do my, my business and I knew I was doing impact, but I didn't have the right the structure or anything. Uh, but working with the United Nations, that helped a lot. So, and having that recognition has helped me to have like better conversations with investors. Great, and, and I'm sorry that I have to do the last question and there's just a lot more that is uh, been uh, asked, but uh, I'll start this question with Aloysius. As, uh, and this is from Sabrina Icon. Um, as enterprises are incentivized to deliver services with as much margin as possible to maintain sustainability, how do the panelists ensure that the bottom of the pyramid are not perpetually left behind? You want to take it? <laughs> yeah. Um like the way we approach it is it comes down to the opportunity, right? Um, and becoming a relevant player or a bigger player consistently. So I'm a subscriber for Spotify. I use this every year, you know, so I'm a return customer. Um, when it comes to farmers, uh, there are very few services that are available to farmers year on year. So it'll be a big program that everybody, millions of farmers will benefit. The following year, the program goes away or after five years, it goes away. So for us, what, what is driving us at this point is like, okay, um, can we sacrifice some margins in the short term to gain the critical mass where we can reach as many farmers where every year we don't have to spend the same dollar going out to get those farmers to come back? How can we ensure that the service is good enough that every year those farmers will come back and pay for themselves year on year? Um, so and when you focus on earning farmers coming back and building services that makes them come back, uh, and then you have a strategy a strategy of sacrificing some margins in the short term. So for instance, when it comes to fertilizer and seeds, in the short term, of course, the margins are gonna be very low, but as you reach many more and more farmers, um, you can become an importer or you can work with your suppliers to have bigger margins, and that helps you to build a stronger business. So for, for us, like in the approach in the short term is sacrifice margins to train farmers for free. All farmers that get fertilizer and seeds, you receive free training in person and also on your phone, Sacrifice margins when, when you're buying your commodities because it's gonna pay it's gonna pay you in the long term and you know that's that's what we're focused on at this point. Great, and I'd like to give the last word to Professor Cole. Uh, your comments, feedback, or advice to the panelists. Oh, I I I just want to encourage the panelists and anybody watching to to jump in and and try to change the world. I think the the thing that I, you know, at some level, I was just a pointy head academic uh, five years ago, sitting in my office writing papers. And now I'm on the board of this organization that's serving 5 million uh, farmers. And I think I'm a, probably a pretty good academic, but I wouldn't have necessarily thought that I was a great social entrepreneur. So I think, you know, one key to success is just giving it a try. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of what Avaz Day is doing. I'm super excited to hear about what Lucia is doing. I'm excited to hear about what Christopher's uh, next venture is, uh, and, and Sebastian, we're working in Colombia, so we may reach out to uh, to connect with you. Uh, so I'm I'm uh, I I wouldn't presume to give you advice. I'd just say kudos, great work, and I look forward to 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 what you're going to do in the next five years. So last word for me, I, I think we're run out of time at this point. Is that if you want to keep on this discussion join the C community. Uh, you know how to do it, or you can just email me if you have any questions. And we should keep this going because it takes all of us to really make a difference in this world. So with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you for attending and goodbye. Especially thank you for all my panelists and Professor Cole. All right, thanks for putting this together. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Larry.